Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining another one of our virtual events. Uh, for those who are new to Astronomy on Tap, we are a global constellation of science enthusiasts who, under normal circumstances, would take over a pub or bar and listen and discuss the latest development in the world of astronomy. No prior science background is, uh, is required, and that's the whole point. Uh, the talks are all aimed to the general public and designed to inform and promote discussion in a relaxed setting. Uh, unfortunately, we are still not able to be with you all in person discussing astronomy over a pint or two. But thanks to the wonders of the internet, we can still all meet and hear about the amazing sciences that's happening around the world. So if you have any questions during this entire evening at any time, just send it to us via the chat function of YouTube or uh, social media, and we'll ask those to our speakers. And we have an awesome lineup for you this evening. So grab a drink, sit back, and drink in the universe with us. Our first speaker is Kieran Fairhurst, who is a PhD student at the University of Sussex and currently procrastinating from writing his thesis by moving to Scotland to work at the Royal Observatory on science communication for the Webb Telescope. He told me to say that, so uh, I didn't make it up. Uh, he works on the most distant galaxies in the universe, trying to figure out how we transitioned from cold, dark universe to one with huge collections of billions of stars. And I cannot wait to hear his talk. So over to you, Kieran. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Can you hear me all right? Can you see me all right? Hopefully. Yes. Yes. Oh, Excellent. Yeah. Right. So the next thing I need to do is share my screen. OK. Does everything, well, does it look full screen? Just to check, I'm not talking in the dark. Yep, looking good. Excellent, right. So I am going to talk to you about something that a lot of kind of astronomy talks, uh, I think, gloss over. And that is um, when you're looking out in the night sky, how do you even know anything about what you're seeing? How do you translate sort of just how bright something is into physical properties of that thing so how big it is how many stars are in it um what do they weigh how old they are things like that so kind of i guess the philosophical core of my talk is going to be you look in your telescope and you see a beautiful image like this so this is um the hubble one of the hubble deep fields so every single speck of light in this image is um either an individual star or a galaxy so a big collection of stars but how would you know which one is the most distant? How would you know, are they all the same distance away? Um, what's the difference between them? How do you tell any of this? Because um, the title of my talk uh, is Small, Comma, Far Away. How do you tell, um, it's from a, a classic Father Ted sketch where uh, one of the priests has this little cow and he's trying to explain to the other one that the cow he's holding in his hand is very small, but the cows out of the window are really, really far away. and in astronomy, that's not an easy question to wrap your head around. So I'm gonna kind of take you through very briefly how we measure distances to things in astronomy because we can't fly out there and get a tape measure and actually measure it. We have to be clever about it. So the, the history of this goes back basically as far as astronomy. So in the olden times, people were really concerned with, ooh, gone a bit far, sorry. So people were really concerned with, you know, the distance of the sun and things like that. And they used a technique called parallax. And ordinarily, if we, we were in person, I'd make you all do this and look like idiots, but such is life. Basically, what parallax is, is if you view something from different points, it can look like the thing is shifting. So a really nice example of this is if you hold your thumb out and you close one of your eyes, and then if you switch eye, which you're closing, it will look like your thumb is kind of jumping from side to side. And with some information about, say, how far apart your eyes are or how long your arm is, you can figure out all the other things. So the way people did this for astronomy was by looking at a star and they would also look. So let's say this is in January for the sake of argument. So in January, you would measure where the star is compared to the background stars. And the background stars we just define as stars that don't seem to move very much when you do this parallax thing. And then what you would do is you would wait six months. So in six months time, the earth will have moved to the other side of the sun because it's half a year. And then what you would do is you would very, very carefully measure where that star is 
in relation to the background stars again. And it will look like the star has moved. And then if you happen to uh, remember your high school maths, or if you have a son or daughter who's doing their GCSE as at the moment, if you know one of the distances of this triangle, so the one you would typically know is the distance from the Earth to the sun, you can use that and the angle to figure out how far away the star is. So that's great. And we can actually use this to go really quite far out. So there's a satellite called Gaia that is doing this very, very, very accurately that can do most of the galaxy using this, which is absolutely fantastic. But unfortunately, you'll maybe if you kind of look at this diagram and think about it, as that star gets further and further away, the angle gets smaller and smaller. And eventually that's going to be beyond your capabilities of what you can measure. And especially if you're doing this in, you know, a thousand BC and all you've got is your eyes and some kind of sticks and string to try and figure out how this star is moving. It's really, really hard to do. So we again needed to be a little bit clever. So um, people started to notice that there was um, stars that pulsated and they pulsate. So they get brighter and they get dimmer and they do this in very, very regular periods. And the period for an individual star can vary a lot. So some of these stars go really quickly. So sort of days and some of them go much much slower so you know maybe months and basically what happens here is the stars kind of happily chilling out and then something will cause it to contract a little bit and when a star contracts more stuff is being squashed in the core so if the star heats up star heats up produces more energy and that kind of pushes the outer layers kind of further and further out so the star gets bigger but this kind of um, forms a bit of a cycle because as the star gets bigger, that reduces the pressure on the core. So eventually the pressure on the core can't make the star get any bigger and then it kind of cools off and you kind of end up back where you started. And these, this cycle is very, very stable in these stars. So it, if it happens once every three days, it will happen almost exactly once every three days. So this is really, really nice. Um, and there was a really, really important discovery about these made in the sort of late 1800s, which was um, if you measure the distance to these stars using parallax, you can then take their brightness and you can turn that into a sort of intrinsic brightness. So this is like a brightness that's corrected for how far away the star is. And uh, this woman is called Henrietta Leavitt Swan, and she was the first to do this. And basically she figured out that stars with fast pulsation, pulsation speeds are intrinsically dimmer and stars with slower pulsation speeds are intrinsically brighter. So remember, this isn't the brightness as we're seeing it because that can depend on the distance. This is their brightness after it's been corrected for how far away they are. So this is as if all the stars were the same distance away. And this discovery was absolutely incredible because this gave us another um, sort of step away. So now what we could do is once we've sort of calibrated this, we can then take a Seaford variable star that's too far away to use parallax, and we can just put it on this plot. We can just measure its pulsation speed and get its intrinsic brightness, and we can sort of parlay that into a distance. So this kind of gets us beyond the distances that parallax can do, and this can actually get us out of the galaxy. So parallax, even with modern technology, was still very limited. It's still very valuable, but which I'll get onto you sort of towards the end, but it's limited in the maximum distance. And this increases that sort of 10, almost 100 fold, which is fantastic. And for this, I think she probably should have won the Nobel Prize, but remember this was sort of astronomy back in the day and we didn't treat people great. So she did get a crater on the moon named after her in the fifties, which is nice, but you know, it was on the far side of the moon because women in astronomy, we don't tend to treat very well. Um, so this, yeah, came around sort of in the late 1800s. And then we kind of move, we can sort of parlay this into something that gets us even further. So I mentioned that this got us out of the galaxy. So this allowed us to measure the distance to galaxies. And this kind of settled a really important debate about whether our galaxy was the only thing in the universe. And it turns out it wasn't. There was lots of these galaxies and they all had varying distances and different properties and they were completely different. And Edwin Hubble came along and he took galaxies that had been, had these distances measured to them. And he then 
decided a little bit on a whim, maybe, um, it's hard to say, that he plotted their, the known distance from these secret variables against what's called their recession velocity. So this, this is basically how fast do these galaxies appear to be moving away from us? And basically, he discovered this plot on the right. I think this is his, his original plot from his paper in, uh, I think it was 1926, I want to say, 29, I forget. Um, and he, he found two really, really uh, striking things, which was, number one, every galaxy, apart from Andromeda, which happens to be moving towards us, but every other galaxy seems to be moving away from us. And then the second one he found was, every galaxy um, seems to follow this line where the further away they are, the faster they're going. Which, I mean, to me, I still find a little bit disturbing, to be quite honest, because it means that everything is just racing away from us. And there's kind of two interpretations of this, which is I, I mean, for sure the universe is a changing place. And there's kind of two interpretations of how it's changing. So either we happen to be in this privileged position in the very center of the universe. Everything moves away from us, but maybe moving towards each other, which feels unlikely. I mean, maybe maybe if you like the idea of humans being special in some way, that's a quite nice feeling, but it feels unlikely if you go off the assumption as astronomers tend to do that we're kind of not in a special place in the universe. So the other interpretation, which is kind of the preferred one nowadays, is that the universe ex itself is expanding. So the analogy for this, and unfortunately I don't have any with me, is um, if, if we were living on, say, the surface of a balloon and the balloon was blowing up, the expansion's kind of not really happening anywhere on the surface of the balloon, but every, every little point on it is moving away from each other. So basically kind of what's happening is more space just kind of appears in between all the things, which profoundly disturbing, but all the observations we make seem to match it. So it's kind of something we've got to go with a little bit. Um, and this has become the foundation of measuring distance to really, really distant things. So things like galaxies. So the only other really, really important, I guess, background for this was um, around this time, another thing was formalized called the Doppler effect which is basically, imagine if you have a star or actually um, you can get this with sound waves too. So if the star is sitting still, it kind of gives out its waves and they all kind of go in the same direction. So I've tried to visualize this here as you, you kind of, you've got the classical kind of up and down wave, but I've tried to visualize that as them coming out as these sort of shells. So then you might ask, okay, what happens if the thing is moving? And if the thing is moving, so I'm gonna say it's moving to the right for the sake of argument, well, as the waves come out in front of that, they get kind of squashed up and they get kind of spread out behind it. So you'll have heard this if you've ever heard, say, an ambulance race past you and the siren seems to sort of drop in pitch as the, as the ambulance passes you. So a similar thing can happen with light. So shorter wavelength light looks more blue and longer wavelength light looks more red. So basically, if all these galaxies are moving away from us, the faster they're moving, the more red they're gonna look because the light gets kind of spread out. So I feel like this is super exciting and you go, oh my God, galaxies look more red as, um, as they're moving away. And then you go and look at what a galaxy kind of looks like and you kind of, you can plot say the colors of the galaxy against sort of how bright they are and how dim they are. And then you get to something like this and then you just sort of go, oh, um, shit because if you move that to the right or the left, well, how would you tell? I mean, it's just a sort of uh, line. And this is where, this is one of those things that I feel like the universe really throws as a bone because ordinarily we would be a little bit screwed here. But if you extend this, so if you go from the visible and into the UV and the infrared, your galaxy spectra kind of looks like this. So it has this really sharp drop in the UV. And so this is fantastic because what you can do is you can track how far that drop moves. So as something goes redder, it's gonna to move to the right. So it's gonna hopefully, let's just skip over this. So this is just showing Andromeda in the UV and the infrared. Um, so as the galaxy moves further and further away, you're gonna get this effect happen where 
this this sharp drop in the spectrum moves to the right, so moves towards the red. And this is really, really helpful because this means that we can efficiently find the distance to these really distant galaxies just by tracking kind of where this drop moves. So for example, if we're taking a galaxy at what we call redshift 5.5, which basically means it, the spectra has been stretched by a factor of six and a half, um, what you, all you need to do is you just need to make wavelength observations at three different wavelengths. So you look at one you know should be at the bottom of the thing, one you think is going to be kind of halfway up, and then one at the top. And you can figure out how far away that galaxy is just by making these observations and kind of looking for it. So this is an example of a real one. So you're basically what you're seeing here is along the bottom, you're seeing a bunch of images of the galaxy. So you'll notice in the the first three individual images, the galaxy doesn't appear. And that's because in the optical, this galaxy has been, all the light in the optical has been redshifted out. And then this galaxy sort of pops up in the near infrared. And what's happened here is this galaxy has just been really significantly redshifted. So this galaxy would have been in the first billion years of the universe. It's very, very old and very, very far away. So yeah, you have this kind of effect where the galaxy doesn't show up in the optical, even though the light originally came out in the optical. Um, so this kind of brings us back to our original question, which is, okay, I look at this thing and how do I know how far away any of the things are? Well, if you're looking at the stars, you can use parallax or you can uh, try and use a CFID variable method or something like that. But for the galaxies, you pretty much have to go off how red they are because most of these galaxies have very, very similar shaped spectra intrinsically, but they get shifted by basically the universe expanding. So the most distant one that I know of in this image that actually shows up nicely is something like this. So you would look for something like that. And you know it's very small because it's very far away, but also it's very, very red because the universe has stretched out the light. Um, so yeah, more distant galaxies look redder, um, but also the light takes time to travel to us. So these galaxies are very old. These galaxies actually, when they initially gave out their light, the universe was completely different. And part of what, I mean, I, I'm trying to do and other astronomers is figure out how are these galaxies different? How did we go from the very, very early galaxies, which are kind of clumpy, angry messes to the sort of more chilled out spiral galaxies that we see now? Um, so if you want to look at more information about this, because I mean, I only had 10 minutes, um, we call this the cosmological distance ladder. And something that's kind of important to keep in mind about it, I think, ooh, I forgot an animation, um, is it's fantastic. And it, each discovery builds on, the, builds on each one in order to build this up. But that means if we think, find out that one of them is wrong, especially lower down, well, it actually changes the distances to everything. So doing these lower down ones is still vital work because it calibrates everything that goes further away. If you figured out that um, something in a parallax calculation was slightly wrong, it would change every distance we measure in the universe because they all ultimately rely on each other. Um, that is all I had. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Thank you so much for that uh, awesome talk. And cheers to you. Um, I have a few questions from our audiences. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I will. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the first question is, um, so the question is, how similar is a Cepheid variable signature to an exoplanet transit? And are they easy to distinguish? That's a really good. So that's a great question, because actually, fundamentally, there are some similarities. So basically, when we look for exoplanets, one of the ways we do that is we look for a, a dip in the light. Um, they're quite easy to distinguish because basically with a Cepheid variable, it's the whole star that's pulsating. So you get this huge sort of sine wave pattern or like a wave pattern in the brightness as you track it over time. Whereas with an exoplanet, most of the time it's not in front of the star. So most of the orbit, it's kind of off to the side or sort of behind or whatever. And then it's only every so often that it kind of goes in front and reduces the brightness. So with an exoplanet signature, you get a very flat thing and then it kind of a, a dip like that, and then it's very flat again. So they're actually um, quite easy signatures to differentiate, but that's a great question. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that awesome answer. 
Uh, the next question is, uh, what are the latest instruments used these days to detect redshift? I mean, so pretty much every telescope can do it. Um, the, the ones that I use to detect really high redshift galaxies, um, so Hubble's great for this, but Hubble is limited because it doesn't go into the infrared very far. So the observations I showed you were from Hubble. Um, the James Webb telescope, when that launches, I'm gonna plug that because it's part of my job. Um, when that launches, that will be kind of the successor to Hubble and that will both be more sensitive, but also go further into the infrared and allow this process to go further down the, down the scale. Um, and then ground-based telescopes, you have things like Keck on Hawaii and Subaru, which they look in the infrared, but they have the disadvantage of being on the ground. So they're usually sensitivity limited. So you might have a galaxy that in theory you can see, but it just doesn't show up because you your telescope isn't big enough. They're the big three, I think. Cool, yeah. Um, and another question, which is, um, somebody was wondering uh, if we have any really hard proof that we are not at the center of the universe, or is it just that it seems extremely presumptuous to, to believe in that? So, oh, okay. so the short answer is no. I mean, we, it depends what you mean by proof, right? Yeah. So do we have irrefutable proof? No, but I would argue we don't have irrefutable proof of anything. So we kind of have to go on what we call like the balance of evidence. And it doesn't seem like we are in a special place in the universe based on any other kind of observations we make. It seems like we aren't in some privileged position. And also the model of the universe expanding, um, I, I don't have time to go into now, but there's lots and lots of other ways to measure that. And there's lots of other predictions you can make and all of those seem to come true. So it's not just this that now we believe um, is the reason, or is the evidence for the expansion of the universe. There's a, there's a whole portfolio of other stuff that was discovered afterwards. This is just kind of the historical first one, I guess. Fair enough. Uh, okay, just two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of them is, uh, so are older galaxies further away? So it depends what you mean by older. So in terms of um, the stars inside, you can have very, very old galaxies that are nearby. So you can have galaxies where the stars formed at the beginning of the universe and they've just been kind of plodding along since then. So examples with that of that would be... Um, I think it's M32. So you have Andromeda and then you have the little one next to it. And I think that one is just like what we call a red and dead galaxy. So it's basically a galaxy that's been around forever and it doesn't really do anything anymore. So you can get old galaxies in the local universe. But the difference with galaxies when we look very, very far away is they might be young galaxies, but they're young galaxies when the universe was very young. So when we talk about them being old, we talk about them being sort of they were born very very early in the universe but they're still they look young to us because the light's taken so long to reach us and it's more about the age of the universe we care about than the age of the specific galaxy cool and uh the last question i have is um is there any evidence of new galaxy creation or formation or are all the galaxies formed already mm, nice yes so modern universe there's no real new galaxies being formed. Um, so galaxies, it seemed like formed very, very quickly. And then what happened is they go through this process of what we call hierarchical mergers, which basically means galaxies in the early universe are very small and then they merge together and make bigger ones and then they merge together and you can make this into like a, a sort of family tree. And then you eventually get to the much bigger galaxies we see today. Um, so yeah, there's no new galaxies being formed now, although there are some galaxies that look very young and we're not sort of quite sure exactly what's going on there, but it's not necessarily that they formed very recently. They may just have like got an, an influx of uh, gas, like fuel to make new stars. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much again for that awesome talk. Um, and now uh, I think we're going to go over to our resident games master, John, who will introduce uh, this month's game. So, um, thank, you. Uh, John. thank you, Jinran, and hello, everybody. Uh, and thanks, Kieran, for that great talk to start the event off. That was that was great, a great start to the event. Uh, so this is the point in the evening where everything gets a little less scientific and a little bit more slapdash. 
so I'm going to be presenting our, our monthly game, and this month's game is uh, based around the discovery of, as I'm sure you've all seen, uh, of phosphine uh, in the in the clouds of Venus, which hints that there might be, maybe, could be, possibly be be some sign of life, possibly micro microbial life. And so uh, the game this week is themed around uh, how we recognize, obviously we don't know, you know, what life might look like on other planets, um, but we've had a stab at it, uh, especially in Hollywood. So this month's game is themed around what the aliens have looked like in different films. So there are eight questions and I'm just gonna share my screen just now. Uh, Okie doke, and I'm sure everybody can see me pressing, pressing play. Okay, so as I said, this month's uh, game is themed around uh, life and alien life. And obviously, we have no idea what life on other planets and other galaxies and other you know, parts of the universe might look like if it exists. It probably does, but we don't know what it might be. But of course, films, they've had a stab at sort of figuring out what they think it might look like. So this uh, month's game is called It's Life, Folks, But Not As We Know It. There are eight questions. Uh, all I need you to do is name the film that the alien in question comes from. Uh, the, obviously, if you were here last month for uh, our fantastic event, we had a wonderful quiz uh, and there were some great, some great questions. We're not as interactive this month, uh, so this is based on the honor system. So if you're at home uh, and you're watching, please note down your answers. Try not to uh, Google on the computer, phone, tablet that you're watching this on. Uh, obviously, we're all, you know, all very ethical, moral people here. So I, I trust everybody to, to put their answers down. And once you have, I will show all the uh, the slides again at the end. And at the very end of the event, I will display the answers so you can figure out how many you got. Uh, and then please put your answers and how many you got into, into YouTube. The prize, unfortunately, this month is just a smug sense of self-satisfaction. Um, but hopefully that's, that's enough to keep everybody playing. OK, so enough talking. Question one. So please name which film this alien came from. This is question number one. Some of these are, are fairly easy. Some of these are a little bit more obscure. Um, so this is, and remember, I will uh, show these again right at the end. So don't worry if you, uh, if you miss any, I'll show them all again at the end. So this is question one. Question two, which film had this uh, and a few others of these based in the film which film had these in these alien type creatures I forget their name and if I gave it I think I might give it away the film anyway so this is number two so remember we're just looking for the name of the film I'll leave that up for a second to get your mind I think this one's the first two yeah pretty straightforward so hopefully everybody gets those two and then you can feel good about yourself Okay, so question three. Uh, for uh, the eagle-eyed viewers, you'll see there is uh, the delectable uh, Dwight Schrute in another form uh, as, as an alien race uh, in another film. In fact, they, these aliens did have another form in this film. They, they had this and, and another form, uh, but this, was, this is part one of their forms in this film. So yeah, which film starred uh, the, the alien-like Dwight Schrute uh, Rain Wilson, uh, and that's number three. Number four, uh, which this beautiful, lovely, glassy-eyed chap here, uh, I think his name was Steve, um, which film starred this? Uh, there are a number of these guys in this film. Uh, so which film uh, starred this lovely guy? And number five, uh, this very attractive uh, group of, of I, I think, I can't exactly remember their name from this film, but they were, they were very, very attractive looking guys. Uh, which film had these uh, very grumpy aliens involved? Question six. Uh, <laughs> slightly, a slightly different one. Uh, so this character, uh, this is Pizza the Hut. 
and which film had Pizza the Hut as a, a starring character? Some breadsticks in, in the bottom right there, just in case you're hungry. Question seven. So this is a, uh, a bit of a, a gimme in case anybody was struggling with the other ones. Maybe you're not. Maybe we have a very smart audience. So everybody's probably getting all these right. And this is way too easy. Um, so this one, uh, again, give me the name of the film. You can give me the full name of the film if you want. Um, you can, uh, there's no extra points in here, but if you fancy giving me any extra details, go for it. Absolutely fine. So this is question seven. And finally, question number eight. Which film did this alien and his uh, his interesting robot friend, which film did these guys come from? This is a slightly older one, slightly trickier than number seven. Obviously, most people got number seven, I'm sure. Uh, but which film did this come from? Okay. I'm going to give you a quick summary of all eight of those. So I will leave this up. Um, just for a few minutes, just so you can look back through, have a think about it, kind of get an idea of which ones you want to do. And then what we'll do at the very end, I will uh, hopefully share the answers and you guys can have a look uh, and see what you think. So I'll leave this up just for a few minutes, just so you can kind of have a flick through uh, and get an idea. If you're very you know, tech savvy, you can screenshot this and then you can put this to one side while we're having the rest of our fantastic talks. Um, so you can do that now if you wish, so you can see what's happening. Um, but yeah, so these are the eight aliens. All I need to know is the name of the films and I will tell everybody the answers at the end of the event. Okay, so Jinran, I shall hand back to you. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, John. I think I got about four out of eight in there maybe, but really put off pieces for a while for sure. <laughs> so now we're all gonna take a short break and we'll be back in five minutes. So see you all soon. And uh, yeah, see you all when you come back, when we're back.
Hi everybody, uh, welcome back. So you should have had a chance to top up your drinks. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to give you some more time to think about uh, those questions John asked earlier. Uh, I still don't think I can get more than four out of eight. So, uh, and no matter how much I think about it, I'm sure, but he's going to give us the answers after our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Ben Giblin. Ben is an observational uh, cosmologist working at the Royal Observatory of Edinburgh, and uh, his research uses astr astronomical images collected at telescopes on top of Chilean mountains to map out the dark matter structure of the universe. Um, but today he is here to tell us about a topic very close to my heart, and that is the road to a more diverse, equitable and inclusive environment in the field of astronomy. And uh, I think this is a issue that's uh, very important. Um, so yeah, over to you, Ben. Thank you, Shinran. I'll I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, is that a uh, full screen for everybody? Yep, looking good. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah. So I study. Um, dark matter at the Royal Observatory of Edinburgh, but today I'm going to be talking about something that I think is a lot more important, which is the road to a more diverse, equitable and inclusive astronomy. So um, there's lots of different ways in which barriers to diversity and inclusion can operate. Someone can face uh, barriers to them participating in something because of their race, their gender, um, whether they have a disability, um, their sexuality, uh, socioeconomic class, and of course, you can have combinations and intersections of all of those things. And it would be absolutely impossible to talk about all those different forms of discrimination in just one talk. So I'm, in this talk, actually only going to focus on the racial diversity and inclusivity of astronomy. And before I continue, I'll just acknowledge that I'm someone who has never faced a barrier to my uh, participation in astronomy and physics uh, because of my racial identity. So I'd, it would be completely disingenuous to present myself as like an authority on this subject. I can't speak from personal experience or anything like that. In this situation, I'm just going to give you a broad overview of the challenges we face when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion in astronomy. Okay, so to begin with, I just want to acknowledge that astronomy has historically always been a global pursuit. It's been practiced by different ethnic groups across the globe. Um, and again, it would be impossible to talk about all the cases of that, but just to give a few notable examples. Um, the Aboriginal Australians, for example, um, have been uh, referred to as the world's first astronomers, owing to the fact that evidence of their astronomical observations date back ten, tens of thousands of years. And here I'm just showing a picture of a constellation that is um, present in many Aboriginal Australian cultures uh, known as the emu in the sky, and it's composed of many um, dark nebulae, so um, places of opaque uh, interstellar gas and dust. Um, medieval uh, astronomers across the Islamic world also made enormous contributions to astronomy. Um, for example, I'm showing a picture here of um, Khwarezmi, who is known as the father of algebra. Algebra itself is an Arabic word. And um, yeah, so medieval astronomers um, advanced mathematical understanding of the motions of the sun, um, the moon and the five, five planets that were known at the time enormously. Um, another example I just wanted to draw attention to is Mayan astronomy. So this is a picture of El Caracol, which is um, a Mayan observatory that's about a thousand years old at Chichen Itza in Mexico. And Mayans perform some of the most advanced pre-telescope astronomy, uh, such that they actually had a more accurate uh, measurement of the length of a solar year than the Spanish colonizers when they arrived in Mexico in the, in the 16th century. 
So all of that is kind of to say that clearly astronomy has been practiced by and has been culturally important to many different ethnic groups. And that makes sense because astronomy has always been a way for human beings to make sense of their place here on Earth. But despite that, we don't see this, um, this very diverse um, historical origins of astronomy reflected in the current racial makeup of astronomy that is taught and practiced at universities. So um, here I'm just showing um, a couple of recent findings. So for example, um, a survey performed by the Higher Education Statistics Agency last year found that only 0.7% of the professors at UK universities identify as black. So that's actually only 128 people out of 21,000 professors. Another finding uh, reported uh, by the BBC last year shows that this lack of diversity isn't just at the higher end of the academic physics ladder, it's also at the lower end. So uh, the BBC reported that there are only 85 black first year undergraduate physics students studying the subject in 2016, only 1.7% of the total. And we can get a more in-depth picture of what's going on um, in terms of uh, the participation of black students in physics by looking at these uh, results from a survey by the Institute of Physics from 2006. So what this flowchart is showing is how the participation of black Caribbean students and black African students in the UK uh, changes as you climb up the educational uh, physics um, pipeline. So, um, and, and that's compared with the participation of white students. So what these, uh, these numbers highlighted by these um, red ovals are showing is that as you go from choosing to study um, or choosing to study physics for GCSE and gaining grades A star to C, to choosing physics as an A-level, to studying it at, un, as an undergraduate, to ultimately choosing to study it for a doctorate, you see that the number of black students leaving the subject at all of these levels, that proportion is higher than white students. And it creates an over-representation of white students performing physics research and going into physics careers. So it's a really concerning picture because it paints a picture where at every stage in this educational pipeline, um, a message is being sent to many black students that tells them this field is not for you or, or they're being channeled away from it. Um, so kind of all of that is to sort of, um, to kind of summarize that. I think as physicists and scientists, we always like to think of ourselves as conducting our research kind of in a vacuum and were abstracted and isolated from the whims and the imperfections and the ills of society and its politics. But I think what a more realistic picture um, presented by the, the research is that in fact, you know, we're not in a vacuum and all of the ills and imperfections that exist in our society and in our politics, they also um, pervade our science. So I kind of want to take a moment and um, bring this a little closer to home and talk about a little bit of local history about the Royal Observatory of Edinburgh, which uh, many people uh, who are watching from Edinburgh will know, and it's on Blackford Hill, it's the place where I work. So kind of how does the Royal Observatory of Edinburgh fit into this complex history? And uh, to find out, you, we can look at a guy called James Lindsay, who was the 26th Earl of Crawford. And that's him in the top left hand corner, sitting on one of his uh, many yachts that he used to sail around the world on performing um, scientific experiments. He was kind of like an eccentric 
um, kind of rich old guy who liked science, basically. And on his travels, he collected lots of priceless scientific texts. So here's a picture of these texts uh, or some of them. So first edition copies of work by Isaac Newton and Galileo and Kepler and uh, Halley and all sorts of very famous astronomers. And he also collected very priceless astronomical instruments. So in um, the 1880s, when James Lindsay found out that the Royal Observatory of Edinburgh was closing, um, he, you know, well, he, he didn't like that at all. And he donated his collection of books and astronomical instruments to the city of Edinburgh. And at the time, the observatory was on Carlton Hill. But with this priceless new donation, they constructed a new observatory to house it. And that is the observatory that we now know and exists on um, Blackford Hill. So uh, the, the kind of important thing here is to trace back where James Lindsay's wealth and these priceless collections come from. And then we can understand where the Royal Observatory com comes from. And the answer to that lies at looking at James Lindsay's grandfather, which is this um, rather severe looking character in the top right hand corner. So he was James Lindsay's grandfather was also called James Lindsay, uh, the 24th Earl of Crawford. And he became uh, extremely wealthy after the abolition of slavery um, in 1833, because he owned 900 slaves on a plantation in Jamaica. And he also owned a one third share of a company that provided slaves to the British army. So when slavery was abolished and the British government uh, chose to financially compensate slave owners. And in order to do that, they took out a loan um, that was so enormous that the British taxpayer was still paying off that loan until 2015. So James Lindsay, the 24th Earl of Crawford, um, received an enormous financial uh, compensation um, for the slaves that he formerly owned. And that money can, was obviously passed down to his grandson, and it resulted in him collecting these scientific texts and therefore in the, in the formation of the Royal Observatory on Blackford Hill. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because it's just, it's just one single example of um, how the institutions that we work in are linked to this tide of history and this dark colonial past and uh, so, in fact, you know, it, go, it goes back to what I was saying before and that, you know, we're not abstracted from history. And in fact, the reason we have a world leading astrophysics institute in the city of Edinburgh can be linked to these great injustices of the past. So it's worth reflecting how this history now manifests in um, the present day situation that we see in terms of uh, diversity in in academia. Okay, so on the subject of history, uh, I wanna bring attention to the fact that it is, um, October is Black History Month in the UK, uh, which is a month to observe and celebrate the um, achievements and contributions of black people for both past and present. And for that, I wanted to spend the last uh, moment of my talk um, presenting some black astronomy history. So I want to talk about a particular researcher, Reva K. Williams, who was one of the first African-American women to um, receive, to gain, an, uh, earn a PhD in um, astrophysics in 1991. And Reva K. Williams, uh, in her PhD, did something amazing. And she basically worked out how particles falling into a black hole can be converted into energy in the form of very um, explosive and very high energetic uh, beams coming out at the top of the bottom of the black hole as pictured here. And uh, this was basically an, an idea that Roger Penrose originally had in 1969. 
And it was just that, it was an idea. And Reva K. Williams was the first person to work out how this, co this conversion of particles falling into a black hole to energy could work and uh, in gory mathematical detail. And um, essentially her, her results explained the um, enormous amounts of energy that astronomers had already observed from supermassive black holes that exist at the center of galaxies all over the sky. Um, so Roger Penrose earlier this week, was, it was announced he is receiving this year's or receiving one third of this year's physics Nobel Prize for his work on black holes. But sadly, Reva K. Williams, her contributions to this field have actually been overlooked by history to the extent that she actually published a letter to the astronomical uh, community in 2004, speaking to a tendency and in fact, a consistent trend of scientists in her field using her results without accrediting her, acknowledging her and citing her work. And in, in astronomy, if people don't cite you, it has a really enormous impact on your career trajectory. So um, I just wanted to use this opportunity to acknowledge and pay tribute to Reva K. Williams uh, contributions to this field. And with that, I will finish and leave you with some uh, fantastic resources to learn more about um, equality, diversity, both in general and also um, in, in the field of astronomy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, for that uh, very important talk. Um, I have some questions from the audience. Uh, and the first question I got was, um, can you tell us what, are there anything, if there's anything being done in Scotland to uh, address uh, those numbers that you showed earlier? Yeah, I think um, I think it's 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 difficult to uh, zero in on a, on a single thing that um, we can all do. I think um, a great thing that everyone can do is kind of um, think quite critically about um, where, like, sort of what situations you find yourself in, and what situations do you have influence over and in what places can you identify um, these kind of racial disparities um, manifesting. And a very common one that, that I think everyone is often witness to is examples of microaggressions. So microaggressions are everyday occurrences often in conversation where people communicate um, biases that make people kind of feel unwelcome in situations. So a notable example was um, a barrister uh, in the UK, a, a black female, uh, Alexandra Wilson, who uh, a couple of weeks ago, she's, she's a barrister, but she was mistaken for the defendant in court three times in a single day. So this is a very sort of explicit example of a microaggression where, you know, there was this message being sent to her about what people think her role in society was and is. And uh, so I think basically a really um, good thing everybody can do is be aware of them and challenge them when they occur and don't be afraid to um, speak out against these sort of things. Yeah, thank you. I think that also answered one of the other questions we had. Um, but the so, uh, final question we had was, are there any cases in other scientific fields where people of color have been better represented uh, through greater participation and encouragement uh, that we can learn from? Um, I think as, as a general rule, um, a lot of the sciences have a problem with racial diversity, but certain sciences are better than others. And um, there's been surveys of kind of how the participation of various um, different um, minority groups have changed over time. And physics has consistently done quite badly. And um, things like chemistry, for example, the participation of certain um, ethnic minority groups in that field has improved over time. And that can be linked to, for example, um, like a lot of 
a high participation of um, Asian minority groups in medicine, for example. So a lot of um, kids from Asian families and do chemistry to go into medicine. And geology is something that has uh, seen better representation over time. But physics is definitely lagging. And that's, I think, why there's a lot of great organizations being formed at the moment. For example, for example, the logo here for BB STEM, which is Black Professionals in STEM, uh, to encourage more um, Black uh, students to go into STEM subjects. Another one here is um, STEM on Route to Change Foundation, specifically focus focusing on these fields as well. But uh, yeah, physics is not is not great. It's definitely lagging. Yeah, a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for highlighting that very important issue in our field. No problem. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, right, I'm now gonna hand back um, over to our resident games master, John, who has the solutions to the quiz from earlier. Thank you, Jinran. I do. Yes, uh, I'm just going to uh, hopefully everybody uh, had a look at that and, and were able to uh, to get some of the answers. So I'm now going to uh, share my screen with you all. Um, and then, Benjamin, would you mind just taking your screen off sharing? Is that all right? Yes, I was just trying to do that, but I've lost <laughs> my mouse. Correct. Don't worry. Uh, Actually, I was going to say, Benjamin, if it's okay, we'd, we'd love to tweet out some of the resources that you shared, because I think it's really, really useful. And I think a lot of people would be really interested in sort of following up on it afterwards. So if that's okay with you, we'll share it afterwards. Yes, please do. Okay. Um, I might have to exit the stream for a second, if that's... No worries. Um, no worries at all. Okay. Um, new share. No, wrong one. This is the magic of live YouTube. <laughs> I was so concerned about sharing my screen in the first place. I never thought about how to. Uh, there we go. Share. I think we're good. Um, okay, you've lost it. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Righty ho. Okay, folks. So uh, hopefully everybody uh, enjoyed the quiz and didn't find it too challenging. Uh, if you did, I apologize. I know a lot of people on Twitter were getting involved and a few people got some sevens, which is very, very impressive. So I'm just going to share up the answers for everybody to see. I'm just sharing my screen now. So here are the answers. So for question number one, it was obviously Mars Attacks. Hopefully I've got that one. Uh, it's a great film. Question two was Men in Black. I can't remember the names of those little weird smoking things, but that was one of those. Question three was Galaxy Quest, which is a very underrated uh, film. If anybody has not seen that, it's a brilliant film with the fantastic Alan Rickman in that as well. Four was Independence Day, uh, Welcome to Earth, being the, the quote when he, Will Smith punches him in the face. Uh, five was The Fifth Element, uh, which is a great Luc Besson film. If you haven't seen that, please go out and see it. Uh, six was Spaceballs, which was uh, the Mel Brooks uh, Star Wars uh, throw up. Uh, send up number seven of course was et the extraterrestrial and number eight which was the slightly more obscure one was the day the earth stood still with the uh the martian coming down with his i think it was a martian with his giant robot uh, so those were the answers please let us know on twitter uh, or on youtube in the comments how you got on uh, and if you won if you got all of them right well done you uh, you have a smug sense of, of superiority over everybody else so thanks for taking part and well done everybody Awesome, thanks. Hey, I got five out of eight, one more than I expected. Uh, cool, well, thank you very much, uh, John. Please tweet in and uh, send us your scores. We'd love to see what everybody got. Um, and now we're moving on to our final speaker for this evening and a great personal friend of mine. Uh, we have Dr. Teresa Fruis, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of London, working on the LZ dark matter experiment. Uh, she is a recipient of the Institute of Physics Astroparticle Physics Early Career Prize last year. So we're very glad to have her here to talk about searching for the invisible inside old abandoned gold mines. Uh, so very uh, interesting and exciting topic. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Shen. And while I share my screen, um, I while I'm currently in, in London, I thought I'd give you a bit of an impression of where we're normally at 
to look for dark matter, we get to travel to the beautiful Black Hills. And this picture was taken about last year about the same time of year. So that's what it's about supposed to look like right now before all the snowstorms come and it's covered in white. But let's get to um, the topic of today, searching, or the one I'm going to be talking about, searching for the invisible or looking for dark matter with the LZ experiment. And before focusing on um, how the experiment is built and what we do with it, um, I want to first of all focus on what the problem is. And the problem really starts with the name dark matter. Um, it's dark, it's non-luminous, we can't see it. We know about it because there are many astrophysical phenomena which show gravitational interactions. So for example, um, if we look at galaxies and how they rotate, um, we need this additional mass which doesn't correspond to any luminous matter we see, but which um, is the gravitational effects of dark matter. Um, then it's also essential for the formation of the universe as we know it. And that's all from astrophysics and cosmology, but I'm really approaching it from the from another side, from particle physics. Um, many particle physicists come up with different hypotheses of what dark matter could be and how it could fit in with the other um, particles we know about, with the particle zoo. Um, which surrounds us and we've, uh, which people have studied for many, many years. And one very popular hypothesis is that um, particles are weakly interacting massive particles. And that really just means it's a part, dark matter would be a particle. It has a mass, which is necessary because otherwise it would not um, have any gravitational effects because that's linked to mass. And we're hoping it's weakly interacting. And that's really, we have reason to believe that, but it's really our um, such that we have a chance at detecting it. Because if it does only detect gravitationally, it will be very hard for us um, to detect it any other way. So how would we go about building a dark matter detector and looking for it? Here yeah, I have to say that there are many different ways of looking for dark matter, and this is not the only one. And I, in 10 minutes, I cannot cover um, everything there is to say about it. Um, so I'm really going to focus on direct detection experiments. Those are experiments which take place here on Earth. So you might think, oh, but dark matter isn't that out there in the cosmos, in the universe? Yes, but in our Milky Way, we also have dark matter. We have an estimate of how much and we move relative to it. So we have a certain dark matter wind and it goes through here and um, these dark matter particles scatter of atomic nuclei. Or that's what we hope. If these are the weakly interacting massive particles, they can just like collide with a normal atom nucleus and will we get an interaction there. So that's the first thing we need. We need some sort of interaction. So how do we build a detector to detect this interaction? Um, we do that um, by building a detector. Um, so what do we need? We need a medium in which the dark matter is likely to interact. So, um, and I will talk about that in a second, what that is. So those are all the ingredients. We need a sensor which can pick up the signal of the interaction. And we need, as these are very um, rare signals and very faint, um, we uh, otherwise, we would have found them so far um, already. We need to get rid of all other interactions. We need to shield against the environment. We need to get rid of um, radioactivity. We need to um, get rid of cosmic rays and all those kind of things. So going through the individual components. First of all, our detector medium of choice, and there are other ones for different experiments, but, we, but what we choose is xenon. Xenon is a noble gas, and we actually use it as a liquid. So we look, use liquid xenon. The reason, or one of the reasons why we use it is that it has very low radioactivity. So all radioactive uh, isotopes, they decay away rather quickly. So we have a nice quiet medium. It's also a nice that if a dark matter particle collides, we can get an excitation. And then we, when this excitation relaxes, we see a faint flash of light. So we do get a signal and we have a signal we can detect. 
Um, you might not be very familiar with xenon. Um, in normal life, you would probably find it in car, li car lights sometimes, or as an anesthetic, it's also sometimes used. It's one from the air around us, so there are trace amounts in the air, um, but it's a quite difficult process to get it out. That's why it's quite expensive. So getting a lot of xenon together for a detector is sometimes quite challenging. So we get these faint flashes of light. So we need a lot of eyes to see them. Now we can't sit like 100 grad students there to watch the detector because we want to see very faint lights and we're in a scientific experiment. So we want to be um, scientific about it. Uh, what we use are photomultiplier tubes. Those are um, light detectors which have a window. And if a single photon, so a single particle of light, goes through that window and hits the inside of the photomultiplier tube, it gets converted into an electron. And this electron can be amplified thousands of times. And then we get a much bigger, a much larger measurable electrical signal. And of course, we don't only want one of these light sensors. In order to have good coverage, we need hundreds of them. And what you can see here on the right in the picture is actually um, an array of these um, PMTs, um, which is used for the LC detector. But I'll talk a bit more about that later. So we've got our detector medium. We've got light detectors. What else do we need? We need to go somewhere where it's very quiet. We need to go far away from all cosmic rays, um, from other radioactivity. So these kind of experiments typically take place um, in underground laboratories and ours is taking place in South Dakota in an old gold mine. And you can see on the map up here that South Dakota is somewhere kind of in the middle of the USA. Um, and here's the mine. Um, there's still gold in there, I've been told, but we're not allowed to search for it. We still have to search for dark matter. But it's not enough to just shield from cosmic rays. What if we build the detector out of lead or something and make it very radioactive? That wouldn't be good. Um, so we want to make it very clean. Um, um, so one thing we do, we screen all the materials we use for the detector, make sure all of them are very radio pure. Additionally, we need to make sure there's no dust inside because dust, you always get a bit of radioactivity. Also radon, radon is in the air. Um, that would also be bad for the detector. And so we built it on the surface in South Dakota in a clean room with radon reduced air and um, monitoring for any dust. So on the right hand side here in the picture, you can see the detector wrapped in, in aluminum foil on, on the left and the scientists look in these funny suits and face masks. Nowadays, it seems more common since COVID, but it used to be very weird to have to wear all these things. And that kind of gives us the detector together. So we have seven for LZ, for Lux Zeppelin, we have seven tons of liquid xenon. We have 494 light detectors. We're one mile on the ground and all our materials were screened and the detector was assembled in the clean room. So having all these things together on the right hand side here, we see um, a, a sketch of the detector. We have a particle incoming. It collides with one of the xenon atoms. We get um, light emission, which we can, get de can detect with the photomultiplier tubes with the light detectors, which are on top and bottom of the detector. Additionally, and I haven't mentioned that yet, is that we get electrons. There's some ionization going on and these electrons we can also use to get a better signal out. And we apply an electric field to the um, detector and extract the electrons to the top of the detector into the gas phase where we get a second larger light signal. So we have two light signals even. Um, and that way we, we can detect events. So now we just need to wait and see um, what happens in the detector and compare it to our background ex expectations. And here is the fully assembled LZ detector, um, all in white. So the white is kind of the field cage, which is needed to apply the electric field. On top and bottom, you can see the, um, the sides of the, of the PMTs. And you can see there are loads and loads of cables to connect everything up. 
as I mentioned, this was built at the surface. So it then had to be, be, um, make all its way underground um, into the place where it's actually going to be used. So on the left side, you can see here, that was almost a year ago now um, that the de detector traveled underground. Um, that was an exciting day, but it all went well. And on the right hand side, a more recent picture of the, the detector inside the cryostat and inside the outer cryostat already and inside a water tank and, and underneath the surface deep on the ground. Um, the water tank is also needed just to um, add an additional layer of shielding. So we will fill it all with water. And you can see the other really important ingredient to building a dark matter detector is having a great team. So LZ is almost 300 scientists. And on site, we always have a great team of techs and um, engineers without whom we would not be able to build this detector. And if you look very closely on this image, you can also um, spot today's host, Jinran, who was out at the, on site building the detector last year. So um, we are almost done building. We are, it's time for commissioning. It's time for data taking soon. Um, what if we don't see anything? And that's always the question which comes up because obviously we're not the first dark matter detector. There have been many dark matter detectors before us. There will hopefully be some behind us. What if we don't find anything? So far, no one has seen anything. And there are always these weird plots and it's sometimes difficult to explain, but I'm gonna try my best. We're exploring a space. We're kind of explorers trying to find um, new land, such to speak. And the space we're looking in is probability of interaction and the particle mass. So if something's very likely to interact, then we would have seen it by now, right? But the, f the less likely it is, is to interact, the bigger of a detector we need, the more time we need to wait to see something, maybe the more um, sensitive the detector needs to be. And similarly, in the dark matter um, a particle mass space, depending on how sensitive our detector is, how small of an interaction we can see, we can push maybe to lighter masses too. So, so far we've seen that dark matter does not live in this space here, but we don't know what's happening beyond this line. So our goal can only be to make a detector which works as best as possible, and then to push this line as far as possible. And maybe we will also find something new. Um, but even if we don't, just exploring this new space and pushing this line a little further will be our contribution to the dark matter search. And that's been, that's already the end of my talk. And so I've just given you a very small glimpse of what dark matter searches are and what we need to look for dark matter. Actually, this month on the 31st of October, apart from being Halloween, it's been dubbed the dark matter day for the past few years. And so this year, um, towards the end of October, there are going to be loads of events. So if you're interested in dark matter, I have the link here there. There will be more talks and things happening to learn even more. And of course, the LZ dark matter experiment, we will be taking data sometime soon. And I link the Twitter and Instagram and also the web page here. So thank you for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Teresa, for that awesome talk. Um, yes, one of the interesting thing about COVID is people finally now know a little bit more about how I feel as a dark matter detector physicist building the detector. We're always paranoid about cleanliness. So always wearing changing gloves, wearing masks to avoid contaminating our detector. And uh, now everybody has to uh, do the same when leaving the house. So uh, yeah, now my wife knows what I do uh, in the labs. Um, so we do have lots of questions. Uh, I'll start with the uh, first question we got is how do you get the detector underground? Yeah, so we had great engineers who thought about it for a long time. And so if you see here, the detector itself, so this detector, you don't want to just drop down like this. It's beautiful white, it's very clean, um, but it sits inside of a cryostat, um, which is just like a titanium vessel really, and that's it the place where it's going to be operated as well. That's going to hold the liquid xenon. And we wrapped it in that first. It's also wrapped in some foam here. And then it was sitting in this kind of sled kind of thing, which just held everything nicely in place and gave it some more stability. 
And then it was hung underneath the cage. So the cage is kind of the lift, which goes up and down the shaft, which we use to travel down every day. And it just hung it underneath it and just went down very, very, very slowly. And it worked well. Cool. Um, the next question I got is, um, who, uh, who finances the construction of these dark matter detectors? So we're funded by both the Department of Energy in the US and um, STFC in the UK, um, because we're mostly between, split between collaborators of, from the US and the UK. We have some more collaborators in Portugal and Russia as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, the next question I had was, is it, is it possible that dark, dark matter doesn't exist in some galaxies? Okay, that's a bit that's a bit out of my um, what I know about much, but because I'm not really from astrophysics, but I do think I've heard about there are these sweet, there are specific galaxies where they think they might not have dark matter, um, but I don't know much more about that. Sorry, but I think I've read a paper about it once that they were like, oh wow, these galaxies don't have dark matter. Yeah, but I guess it's like earlier, no reason to assume we're special <laughs> um, or unique. Um, okay, so the next question I had was, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the electronics used in the PMTs? Like what are their sensitivities? How little light can they see? Since you say they're the eyes of the detector instead of PhD students. Yeah, <laughs> so we can single, see single photoelectrons, uh, single, fo sorry, we can see single photons. Um, that's that's the requirement we've tested all these photo tubes for. Okay, wow. Um, had a question was, uh, does color make a difference in building the detector? I guess you said everything's very white, so it looks very clean, but does that so matter? We, we do use the white, um, the, the Teflon here, because it's very, um, we want to collect as much light as possible, right? So we want to have, um, good light, light collection and we want it to reflect off the surfaces and then in the end land in the PMTs even if the light first went in the other direction. So that plays a role. Yeah, it's true. Um, okay, we have so many questions. Uh, the next question I had is, uh, is assumption that dark matter is weakly interacting matter uh, just a hope because otherwise we wouldn't be able to detect it or is there any theoretical or experimental reason to assume that? WIMPs is the dark matter candidate. So there are um, theoretical um, there are theoretical reasons for it. Um, again, I'm not an expert, but it's motivated both from particle physics, where there's a range of weakly interacting massive particles, which came through extensions of our standard model. At the same time, from cosmology, um, when you calculate the abundance of dark matter of how much there should be um, from like the start of the universe and compare um, having weakly interacting like particles at a weak scale matches. So sometimes that's called the WIMP miracle. So there were really thorough theoretical reasons of why um, dark matter particles might be weakly interacting. Yeah. But they could also be something else. Um, <laughs> that's why it's so exciting. Yeah. Um, right. Two more questions. Uh, firstly, is can you determine uh, the where the incoming particle is coming from, like directional uh, detection? Can you detect the direction of the dark matter coming in? Unfortunately, not with this type of detector. There are directional detectors which make use of us knowing, oh, the dark matter when could sh come should be coming from this direction, like drift, for example. If you want to look it up, um, it's a directional detector. Um, but with LZ, we don't have that capability. Mm -hmm. And uh, last question, quite a lighthearted question, I think. Uh, do you have a favorite name for a dark matter model like Harry Wimps? I did not know that was a thing. So, <laughs> like, no. do you have a favorite dark matter <laughs> candidate? I guess maybe the question. I don't know. Uh, clearly, I need to think about that. Um, I think my favorite I heard recently is Wimpzillas. I think that's a real, I thought it was a joke, but they're a real thing. So very excited about that. I think my favorite one would be the one we detect. So <laughs> I'm too fast about the name. That's a good answer. Uh, well, awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, Teresa, for that amazing talk. Um, I'm just going to share a slide with uh, everyone. Since you talked about uh, dark matter 
uh, day at the end of this month. Um, so yeah, Teresa, you gave this amazing introduction to the exciting world of uh, dark matter hunting. So if people here were interested to learn more about dark matter, I just wanted to take this opportunity to let everyone know about uh, the 31st of October is Dark Matter Day. Um, and to celebrate it this year, our UK Deep Underground Laboratory is teaming up with our American counterpart. Uh, so we're doing a little earlier on the 29th of October. Uh, so you can still have time to go trick or treating on actual Halloween. I know I would like to. Uh, you just heard that Teresa said that our experiment is called LZ. Well, that's a combination of Lux and Zeppelin. Zeppelin was born in the UK and Lux in America. And LZ is the combination of these two great experiments. So join us on our 29th of October as we explore everything related to dark matter. And um, the sign up link I've shown us here on this slide, but we'll post these links on our social media pages too. So if you're interested, stay tuned for more. Um, right, perfect. Well, then all there is left for me to say is um, thank you to all the speakers tonight and to all the audiences that joined us to watch uh, Show Me Off Tap, uh, Edinburgh. And uh, if you can take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel, that'll be much, much appreciated. It really helps us a lot. And we'll be back next month on the 10th of November. So see you all then. And in the meantime, good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>